Okay, in this presentation, I want to talk to you a little bit about the background to the painting that we're going to be doing for our second portfolio. Uh, give you a little bit of context of where this style came from, how it developed, and how it contrasts with earlier styles. Um, our first painting was a linear style painting. And if we look at this painting here by the Dutch artist Willem Kauf, uh, this is an excellent uh, exemplar of that particular style. Now, obviously, this is not to the level we're working. Uh, he's been painting a very, very long time, and it takes a very, very long time to do these kinds of paintings. But this was done in the 17th century, in the 1600s, and you can see it's got almost a photographic quality. So this would be an extreme example of the linear style. And by linear, uh, we've talked about, you know, how there's really no brush strokes or drips or marks. And, you know, we zoom in close on the lobster, everything is blended and all the details are really super finely done. And this whole effect became achievable with the development of oil paint. So when oil paint first came onto the scene, artists were able to, you know, create textures and and transitions of color and kind of luminance qualities and just a richness and a depth of paint and blending and technique that was unheard of before. Uh, prior to oil painting, one of the most common and most popular techniques for painting was tempera. We've seen tempera before, the beginning of the course. Uh, this is using egg and Botticelli's The Birth of Venus is, is a fine example of that. If you look at a tempera painting uh, really close up, you can see that blending tempera is very, very difficult. And so what we find when we zoom in is we get very, very small brush strokes. Now Botticelli was extremely uh, adept at this. So he's able to get areas that, you know, he worked super fast in order to blend, but we can see his brush strokes appearing in the shadows, you know, coming down the eye and over the nose and the shadow under the neck. And obviously it's good for doing hair because it's just uh, straight lines. But when you're trying to do transitions for lights and dark, you are going to get a really kind of, um, interlocking hatches of color with a very, very fine brush. And then we move to another section of the painting. Again, we can see, we look at the hand, the shadow on the hand, these very, very fine lines of brown to create uh, shading that's happening. And, you know, here the darkness in the background. And we can also see a very interesting part of the painting where either Botticelli made a correction or he, uh, it's been restored and somebody made a mistake. So. Uh, getting close to paintings is always pretty fascinating. But with tempera, as with fresco and all the other techniques that had existed prior to the 15th century, uh, you were unable to get this kind of luminous, blending, smooth quality because everything just dries so very, very quickly. And the person largely credited with being able to achieve that was Jan van Eyck. Now, he didn't invent oil painting. It had been around. People had tried to use it, but there was always the problem we had talked earlier with the idea of it not drying very well. Uh, and what Van Eyck did was he was one of the artists, along with several other artists at the time, such as Robert Campen, who were able to develop um, ways of drying their oils very, very quickly. And so we look at his portrait of Arnold Feeney and his wife, probably the most famous painting by Van Eyck. Uh, we can see a painting that, you know, in 1432, this really set the bar for what painters were going to do in terms of realism, uh, linear style, uh, textures, richness of color. And if we zoom into this painting, uh, we can see, you know, here's, here's a figure and, and a female figure, there's fruit on the table, the window's open, there's a chandelier. But if we look at the middle of the painting, uh, there is this mirror on the wall, and we move closer to the mirror, uh, we can see in the mirror, there are two figures, uh, the back of Arnold Feeney and the back of the woman uh, he's, or his wife that he's holding hands with. We see the chandelier, we see the window, we even see the fruit. And if we look in the middle, there is what appears to be a doorway and two people in the doorway. So this is a very, very fine detail. And the actual size of the mirror is only about two inches. So this is an incredibly detailed, um, precise, method. So no matter how close you get to the painting, and here we're going to zoom in even more, it's you still don't see brush strokes and marks. It looks very, very realistic. And here we can again see the room with the chandelier and the beams and, and the fruit and all that information on the table. So what Van Eyck did was he really kind of set the pace for future painters like Willem Kauf that we saw at the beginning in terms of developing oil paint to create this super fine uh, visually almost photographic reproduction long before uh, there were cameras. 
but not everybody followed his lead. There were many painters that came shortly after him, including Titian, uh, for one, who had a very different approach to painting. And that was the painterly approach. And what Titian did was he inspired generations of painters after him, one of which was Diego Velazquez, one of the most famous painters in the, in the history of Western painting. And if we look at this painting, it's his, uh, considered his masterpiece, Las Meninas. It's a huge canvas, and it looks incredibly realistic. But if we zoom in, we zoom into the figure in the middle, which is the princess, uh, we begin to see a different kind of approach to painting. What we're beginning to see is brush marks, very, very loose, and even bits of raw canvas sticking out. And so his treatment of the surface and the paint uh, was much, much looser. We can see the, the dabs of, you know, very visible, clear brush strokes on the dress and the sleeves. And if we move into the, the flower or the corsage on her dress, we see it's just a series of dabs and dots. Now that we would not have come, would not have seen anything like this with Van Eyck or the Dutch painters. No matter how close we got, it would have looked exactly like a flower. So what Velasquez is developing is a, is a shorthand, um, a very precise shorthand that is able to communicate from a distance what we're looking at. And you can see here some of the canvas uh, that's showing through. And so this is a very, what we call, loose technique. Um, he's not trying to hide the paint. Uh, the paint is clearly visible, but it's a very difficult technique because you have to make sure that the marks are in the right place, there's the right number, they're the right thickness, the right color, the right value, and all of that takes an awful lot of practice. And so we look at a few more examples of painterly style through the history of art. Rembrandt was a, another famous example. Just looking at the paint on the face, you see that kind of oily, gooey paint, and even in the hair where we have the curls, uh, this was just wet paint that he gouged into with the back of his brush. And so Rembrandt's paintings are renowned for when you, you, know, you get close to them, they just dissolve into these sorts of abstract uh, messes of color and line. And when you zoom, walk back, they become a figure. And here, here's a good example. Another painting by Rembrandt, a woman wearing a very rich, brocaded and materials on her dress. But if we move in on her sleeve and get close to the painting, again, it still looks like you know rich material, but when we get very close to it, it just dissolves into this abstract um, conglomeration of marks where we don't even, in this case, see brush strokes. Uh, how he made it is, is very much a puzzle. But um, that became the hallmark of painterliness. Uh, where people would get close to the painting and it's just very abstract and loose and as they move back the painting would uh, resolve itself. Another example by Rembrandt, portrait, and then we move close uh, to the hands. Uh, we can see uh, Jan Six's coat and just these, you know, each one of these is just a dab of the brush and then a dot 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 coming down and you know, we look at the sleeve, we look at the finger, sorry. Um, you know, this is just in many ways, just virtuosic. It's, it looks like it's just dab, 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 dab like this, which technically it is, but knowing how to do that um, takes years and years of experience. So this is um, you know, what we're gonna be doing next. Uh, I'm not expecting you obviously to be anything like a Rembrandt or a Velasquez, but we're gonna try it out. We're gonna uh, have our own take on it and just try and make a painting where there's lots of brushwork visible. Um, and that we can see that the painting is composed of paint and we're even going to take some liberties. So I'll show you some examples in a minute, but a bit more about the history. So um, in the 18th century, a period known as the Enlightenment, we had three major revolutions, the scientific, political, and industrial. And what all of these had in common was that um, reason or rationality became, um, let's say, dominant in, in the European psyche. So the scientific revolution overthrew the control and the um, power of the church and the political revolutions got rid of the monarchy and the industrial revolutions shifted everything from a very agricultural society to uh, much more of an urbanized uh, centralized society with the with the use of technology inventions the steam engine and things like that so this was a very exciting and revolutionary period in, in European history and in terms of the arts there were two responses to this uh, known as neoclassicism and romanticism and what neoclassicism did was it looked at these revolutions and said, well, we need a new art that will embody the, the rationality and the science and the, um, 
you know, this, the sense of reason that all of these things represented. And to do that, they looked back in history and looked at the classical arts of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, which themselves were based on reason, proportion, rationality. And so neoclassicism became a style that mimicked the classical, hence the term neoclassical. However, there were another group of artists known as the Romantics who felt, well, you know, we just had all these revolutions, uh, societies changed dramatically, why would I want to be a slave to another style, another school? And so Romanticism really prioritized the individuality of the artist and the idea of freedom uh, and do things your way, you know. The scientific revolution was about freedom, the political revolution was about freedom, the industrial revolution was supposed to be about freedom. Um, so they, the Romantics took freedom very seriously, and so their approach was less uh, emphasis on rationality and reason and more on imagination and individuality. And so they gave birth to two very different styles. So in the neoclassical, we see the linear style. Um, this was a technique that could be taught well in the academies and the ateliers. Uh, it looked back to the past, and so a lot of the subject matter might deal with you know, Greek and Roman subject matter or architecture. But this painting by David, you know, it's a very linear painting. Everything's blended, and everything's smooth, um, it looks very, very realistic uh, and from a linear perspective. And then other artists who worked in the neoclassical genre, like uh, Ang, you know, portraits that were very, very um, photographic for their time. Now I'm going to compare and contrast this style with the romantic style by looking at a particular subject known as the odalisque. So the odalisque was a, a harem woman. Uh, the French had colonized North Africa and so tales of harems and uh, women were replete through French society. So they became a very popular subject matter. So here's another painting by Ang. We've seen this before in previous slideshows. And again, it's a very uh, linear approach. Now we contrast this with another odalisque done by a romantic painter, in this case Delacroix, you can see the difference. Uh, very loose, very painterly, uh, the edges are not clearly defined, um, there's very visible brush strokes, it's very clear what's happening down here. Uh, and this was, you know, met with a lot of derision in French society, and especially from the neoclassicists. They looked at this as, you know, people who don't know how to paint, or people that were just learning how to paint, or maybe this was just a study for a proper painting. So there was this great division. Uh, cultural division in Europe between the Romantics and the Neoclassicists. Uh, another Romantic artist uh, in this vein would be Goya um, for lots of reasons, but in terms of his painting technique, again, you can see this very uh, loose kind of brushwork uh, on the figure and her clothing and the treatment of the background and things like that. And so whereas Neoclassicism, you know, embodied this kind of sleek, slick, linear, highly blended style, uh, romanticism was much more uh, looser, much more painterly, and in terms of subject matter, dealing much more with contemporary events. You know, here we're obviously looking back to the past and stories from history and mythology. And the Raft of the Medusa by Jericho is uh, dealing with contemporary events. So the content and the subject matter of the art kind of went hand in hand uh, with each other. And what eventually came out of romanticism was the Impressionist movement and Claude Monet. Uh, considered by many to be the leader of the Impressionists. Here, here's his Impression Sunrise. And you can see the paint is just broken into dabs, just very, very loose. And, you know, again, people, you know, would just cringe at this stuff at the time because they'd say, how can this be people in a boat? It's just a black blob, you know, or you call that, you know, reflections on water. So it was very controversial at the time. I'm not going to get into the history behind it. Um, but there was a huge cultural division between the old guard that felt that, you know, this new stuff was corrupting the youth, uh, was very, very dangerous. Uh, again, another painting by Monet. You can see the brushwork, the looseness, his treatment. Um, this is a painting by Renoir that I took in Chicago. Uh, if we look very closely, they're having some sort of uh, luncheon party in a restaurant maybe. And if you look at the table and zoom in, the whole thing just dissolves. Yeah, so the glasses, the, the bottles, the cups, everything. So it's a very demanding technique. It's very hard to do. Um, here's a few more examples. This is Edvard Munch. Uh, self-portrait in the clinic. You see the treatment of the background is much looser than the face, but even the face, if you get close, just sort of unusual colors, lots of brush strokes. Um, 
painters today, like Lucian Freud, um, I say today, he actually passed away recently. Um, you can see again, he, they're the heirs of this tradition of being very painterly uh, with their work. And it's a very individualistic technique. So people take it in very, very different directions and have different ways of dealing with it. Uh, for, uh, we've seen this painting by Ian Paul Wright, um, sorry, by Paul Wright, painting of Ian. Um, I showed it earlier to talk about the uh, tonal structure. And so the same thing applies here, right? This is very painterly, but it works if you keep the tones correct. And that's what we're going to be doing. So I'm going to allow you to have a little bit more freedom with the colors. You don't have to stick to the true hues. You can be exaggerating them a little bit, um, but make sure that the value structure is correct. And here's a few more examples. Another two more paintings by Paul Wright. Again, if you squint your eyes, you can see the darks over here and the light on her cheek. Uh, and likewise here, the light's running down and then you know, kind of a core shadow down the middle, lights here and then more darks. And again, the same principle is at work. The lights are different colors, but similar value. The darks are also different colors with similar value. Uh, another example by Alan McGowan, uh, very, very painterly. Again, squint your eyes and you'll see the tonal structure. So we're gonna work backwards. We're gonna be looking at things, squinting our eyes, finding the tonal structure, and then trying to make the, build the painting from that. Um, Kai Samuels Davis, another uh, painter working in the genre. Um, you can see the, the cup and the boots. And I encourage you to look these people up online and see many more examples of their work. Uh, Wayne Thiebaud, a very famous Western artist, beach scene. Uh, this is Manet, not Monet, not to be confused with Monet. This is a portrait of Barrett Morisseau. And again, you can see just this incredible economy of means. Just doesn't have to be lots of different colors and brush strokes, but just very simple. Uh, that's another aspect of it. So all of this is just almost one solid color of black, which was unheard of at the time. Things needed to be developed and refined. And uh, so Manet was getting away with this. A painting by Sargent, John Singer Sargent. Again, very realistic, like Velasquez, but if we zoom in and look at her sleeve, incredibly painterly. Just kind of wiggles of the brush, marks, dabs, look at the background, uh, just masterfully done. Now, not everybody uh, in modern art as a painter works this way. This is just an example of Alison Watt. She's a Scottish painter. Um, so with postmodernism, that whole division between you know the modernists and the traditionalists or the neoclassicists and the romantics just fell apart and with romant with postmodernism everything's allowed so we see a resurgence in linear style painting and photorealism and things like that and this is allison watt in her studio you can see these are huge paintings all right so Painters generally don't pick one side or the other. They work somewhere in between here. Some are more painterly, some are more linear. Um, but this is generally the, the spectrum that most people work on. You know, you can place most painters somewhere on this line. But it's important to know that these two things are different than these two things. Whether you're representational and painting images of things or you're being non-representational, just shapes and lines and colors, um, it's independent of these things. In other words, you can be painterly and non-representational. You could be linear and non-representational, as these demonstrate. So here's two representational images. Uh, one's linear, one's more painterly, and then two non-representational images, Ellsworth Kelly and Willem de Kooning. Uh, here's some student works. Uh, this is a setup that you can probably tell some of the objects from class. And you can see uh, how he's treated it. It's very, very loose. And this is even his underpainting, the blue canvas coming through. So you're going to have the option to leave some of your canvas empty or pieces of your canvas empty and showing through your painting. Uh, another example, um, very simplified, kind of made more geometric, uh, excellent work by a student. What I don't want you to do is get too crazy so we can't tell what we're looking at, uh, whether it's a still life or even Frank Auerbach's uh, portrait. Um, so I'll talk to you about it. We'll look at your work. And we can even see that in digital art, we can have the painterly option. So for this painting, um, here are the criteria. Here's what I want you to focus on. The number one thing is visible brushwork. It doesn't mean it has to be thick. It just has to be visible, but it can be thick in places or all over. The correct value structure. This comes from squinting. Um, the correct proportions. This would be from the drawing and the scaling. Uh, you can simplify, leave out a lot of details. And then correct hue. We want the hues to be 
correct, but it's at the bottom of the list here, meaning you can play with things. So if you have something that's red, you can add purples and oranges, you know, things either side of the red to kind of make them more interesting. All right, so that's it. A quick background to the style. If you have any questions, don't forget to email me or post them on the course website.